My name's John Russo. Thank you for joining us at Sabina Road Church Online. I'd love for you to join us on our website at sabinaroad.org, on Facebook, or on YouTube. Also, I'd encourage you to invite your friends to watch these special services with you. Um, so thank you again for tuning in to this special service, and welcome again to Sabina Road Online. Every soul, every beating heart, every nation and every tongue, come find hope in the love of the Father. All creation will bow as one, with their eyes in the risen sun.
of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you oh. Jesus, the name above every other name
Welcome to Sabino Road Online. Whether you're joining us through our website or you're joining us through social media, uh, either way, we wanted to say thank you uh, for joining with us this morning. I did want to encourage you to please share this content. Uh, if you can't remember to do it later, share it right now and come back to the message. Uh, we have a, 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 a story that we want to tell. We want to bless and encourage people. So the more people that we have sharing, the more people that we can reach. Um, also, if you've been a part of our life groups, um, we've done online before this message. I hope they were a blessing to you. They will continue to be done online and through Zoom uh, for the foreseeable future. Last but not least, I wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Sabina Road, for your generosity. Thank you for your faithfulness. As you know, our church still has financial needs during this time, and so we need your financial support if you are one of our people. And so thank you for those who have been faithful in that regard. Also, I wanted to say thankful, thank you for your care and love for people in this city. I've heard all sorts of encouraging stories that have blessed me of you guys showing love and compassion to people um, who've needed it. So thank you. I love you. Uh, let's get into our message. The title of today's message is Disrupted. We'll be looking in Acts chapter 11. We'll be looking at verses 19 through 26. Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 26. I had a cousin who worked for a funeral home when he was a young man. And I remember one particular occasion he was telling me he had just got off of, out of school and, 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 he, and he went there and got to his job at the funeral home. And, and uh, his boss said, hey, you're, you're leading this funeral procession, so uh, throw on this coat and I want you to take him to this uh, particular cemetery. And so... Uh, he did that, and he, he threw on his coat, and he he uh, and he got in the car, and he began leading the funeral procession. The, his boss told him there wouldn't be police officers with him this time, so it would just be him. And so he begins uh, driving down the way, and he's going for uh, several miles to one of the two cemeteries in town. Uh, and he, but he doesn't remember exactly where he's supposed to go. Uh, but he remembers uh, several miles into this trip that he, he finally remembers that where the boss had told him to go was the other one. Now you have to remember this was before cell phones and, and pagers, so he didn't have any way to contact anybody. So after driving several miles in the wrong direction with a funeral procession of cars following behind him, he turns on his blinker light and he, he brings a whole procession of cars uh, through a neighborhood uh, and then through some undeveloped land, and uh, then eventually uh, he gets to the right cemetery. And as he gets out of the car, he can see uh, two groups of people coming to him. First is his boss, who happens to be his father-in-law also, and he can tell that he is steaming angry, and he is stomping over towards him. And on the other side, he sees the the family members of the deceased coming towards him, and he uh, he began he, the, the the family members get there before his boss does, and uh, and they're giving him a, a a big hug, and he's a little confused by that. And the family says, "You know what? Well, things like that make this funeral home special. We don't know how you knew that this is that you drove right by." Where dad grew up, <laughs> and that's exactly what happened, and uh, and so not all detours are bad. Sometimes they can be good, but nobody likes detours. Uh, they can be uh, challenging. They can be difficult. They can be frustrating. Um, detours are, are are not something that we would sign up for, but they're not always bad. You see, God's detours can be good for you. 
my main focus of today's message that I want to encourage my brothers and sisters this morning is make sure that we trust God when He disrupts your plans. In a very real sense, our plans have been disrupted. They've been disrupted as a church, as a city, as a country, really the world uh, at large has had their plans disrupted. It's important for us to understand, church, when God disrupts plans, sometimes they can be used, and many times they are used for his good and glorious purposes. So let's read our passage today, and we'll get into the text. Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 26. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists in preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you've given us the ability and the means to be able to communicate with each other in these times of isolation. Lord, I pray that your word encourages and challenges on your people this morning. Father, we love you and I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Point number one, we see the church scattered but strong. We see this in verse 19. Verse 19 says, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. The church had been spread all over. You see, the, uh, the, the, the persecutor of the church was Saul right now. Now Saul would eventually become Paul and God would disrupt that plan uh, as well. But right now, Saul was a brutal enemy of the early church. And he was the one that was leading the crowds to kill Stephen, the first martyr. He was responsible for that. So there was great persecution in Jerusalem. There was great persecution for these early Christians. Unfortunately, persecution has not been an isolated event in church history. All throughout church history, all throughout the history of the church, there has been uh, times and, uh, and seasons of great and dangerous persecution. Even now in our modern world, uh, there are uh, great persecutions happening to our brothers and sisters in Christ in a variety of places. So this persecution was happening to this New Testament church. And and then we see because of this persecution, they were scattered. They were spread out. We see that they go to distant countries and cities. We they, they go to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. These some of these places were several hundred miles away from Jerusalem. You have to understand this is before Expedia and Uber. And this was a this was a long travel. This was a long, hard road where they had to leave their homes. They had to leave their property. They had to leave their families. They had to leave everything because of this persecution. It's hard. It's hard to, to travel that sort of distance in those days. It, it's hard for me to travel distance as a family man. I, I, it takes me 45 minutes to get my kids in the minivan. Uh, they're showing up, and one doesn't have a shoe, and the other one wants to bring uh, the dog, and, and 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 you can never figure out what's happening here. And, and by the time you get them all buckled up, and you're it's, you're already late for wherever you're supposed to go. It's it's hard to travel now. Imagine traveling in those days was very very challenging. 
But as they travel, they began sharing the gospel in the synagogues. You have to understand these early Christians were all Jewish, and so their community, not just a faith, but their communities were the Jewish people. And so when they went to these cities, they went to these uh, other countries, these distant lands, the first places that they'd go to were synagogues where there were people like them. So although they were scattered, uh, the gospel was being, the gospel knowledge and gospel proclamation was increasing. They, they weren't bitter. They weren't angry with God for this persecution and, and hobbled up and hiding. No, they were still sharing the message of the gospel. This persecution was allowing the seeds of the gospel to be spread all over the world. You see, troubles and trials, turmoil, pushed the church to do what it otherwise would not have done. Until that point, the Christianity was uh, pretty well localized in Jerusalem and in Israel. Most of it had not been spread abroad until the persecution came and scattered the church. I believe God was using that persecution, not that God was the author or the source of that persecution, but God used that persecution in the early church. To, do, to help Christians do what they would otherwise not do. Like a loving father, he knows, he, he guides, and, and a, a loving father will, will push his children knowing that what they can and what they, that they cannot do, but without a little bit of help, without a, bit, a little bit of push, they would not do it. You know, uh, in certain times of year, a little dandelion uh, weed flowers pop up all over the place, and they have these little seeds, and when you blow them, they go everywhere into your yard and make a, a lot of work. Now, I've actually read reports that um, some of those little dandelion seeds, when they get blown, there's been some very rare isolated uh, times when they were actually blown hundreds of miles away uh, from where they actually started. And so these dandelion seeds can be, are, are blown, they get stuck on anything and everything, and they kept popping up uh, just about anywhere. Well, the early church was facing a similar challenge. They had been blown, not by literal winds, but by the storms of life that began blowing the early church all around the world. And instead of, 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 of hiding from uh, and growing bitter from this persecution uh, and, and huddling up and, and quitting and giving up, uh, they began to spread around and stick on everything in, the, in churches. And, and, and communities of faith began popping up everywhere. I hope we understand today, church. The church is not simply a building. It's not something that you go to. And church is not even something that you do. The church is what we are. We are a body of believers. The church is a community of of people who follow Jesus Christ as Lord. We are a community of faith. We are the body of Christ. So it's important to understand our modern conception of the church. When we say, hey, we're going to go to the church, what we mean is a building of brick and mortar. And that couldn't be any further from the New Testament the biblical concept of the church. It's not something simply that we do or, or something that we go to. The Bible says the church is what we are. And so when we are at our homes, when we are in our neighborhoods, we are the church abroad. We are the church spread around. We're not just the church when we're gathered here on this physical property um, off uh, at Sabino Road. And we are the church um, even in your homes this morning. We're not bound by bricks and borders. We are the body of Christ. And the New Testament church understood this and they turned the world upside down. They were a people that, 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 that the, the world would not have thought highly of, many of them slaves, many of them poor. And yet God used this movement, this church, to, the, to, to turn the world upside down. We can do the same. 
I want to encourage you, church, to let the storms of life propel you towards obedience. It's easy when we have the storms of life to do the opposite of that, that we want to be disobedient, uh, that we can become angry, we can become bitter, we can, uh, we, we can shut down and, and not share. Uh, because the storms of life that we're facing. We want to hunker down and, and just get through it. But the New Testament church, when, when they were, were facing the, the persecutions of life, they allowed that um, to, to propel them towards obedience. So whether you're in your homes or, or in your neighborhoods or when we are sooner or later allowed to get out uh, and about, that we allow this, this time, this trying time in our country uh, to to propel us towards obedience, and that God can use this in a special way. Brothers and sisters, we are scattered, but we are strong. We are meeting in a variety of places this morning, all around Tucson and elsewhere. We are scattered, but we are strong. So point number one, we see that the church was scattered, but they were still strong. Point number two, we see the church steered, but not stifled. The church was steered, but not stifled. We see this in verses 19 through 21. So let's look at the end of verse 19. So they had been at Cyprus and Antioch, speaking to, to no one except the Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. See, we see the church has been steered, but not stifled. See, initially, Christian Jews only shared with other Jews. Uh, this was there a, a lot of reasons for that, but it... It's, it's certainly un, understandable that people uh, who to, to share and to want to be around people like you. And that's what they were doing, at least initially. Um, but then they changed tactics. They began sharing uh, with non-Jews, with Greeks and Greek speakers, and uh, what we would just simply call Gentiles. And most of us who are watching this are, are Gentiles. We are not Jewish. So they began sharing with people like us, people that were different from them. You have to understand, it was not their plan, but it was God's plan that they initially would, would didn't want to leave Jerusalem. But when they left, they began sharing uh, with, with Jews, but then they began sharing with other people. And it's all part of a plan that God was using and helping orchestrate. So the Lord blessed, and many were saved. You see, they were doing God's work with God's power, and so they got to see God's productivity. Uh, they began um, sharing and, 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 and doing it the way that God wants them to do it, with, with, with Christ being glorified, and they had the, the hand of the Lord was on them, and, and people began uh, trusting Jesus. They, be, uh, they got saved. People were turning from their sins, and God was blessing this effort. God was blessing this work. I encourage you, church, to trust God when he alters your plans. Trust God when he alters your plans. See, our plans don't usually involve pain, difficulty, hardships, or heartache. But sometimes those are exactly the plans that God wants to take us through. God has a variety of reasons for that, and we're going to talk about that a little bit in the last point. But it's rarely our plan to go through hardship. We usually do everything we can to steer a long ways away from that. But God says, you know, knowing our hearts and knowing our souls and our characters and the ultimate purposes that he has for us, he, he'll, he'll bring us sometimes right through the path of hardship and, and pain and, and trials and, and difficulty for our ultimate good. 
you know, I, I grew up in Florida, and, and Florida uh, is prone to hurricanes. It's just a part of life there. And, and I remember one particular storm, the winds were really strong. They were sustained winds, and that wind just kept blowing. That wind just kept going. And, and a couple of days after all the storm had finished and, the, and you were allowed to go out and about, um, I was surprised at the type of trees that were on the ground. A lot of the big, thick trees that you thought would be able to stand in the storm had actually fallen over. And the ones, many of them that were smaller and sort of wispier plants that you thought for sure wouldn't make it had actually uh, weathered the storm and were standing there just fine. And it turns out the big, hard trees that were rigid and in, inflexible, um, that they could not take the storm. They just fell over and crashed. But the smaller ones, because they were thin, they were flexible, uh, they were able to bend and, and not break. Uh, they were able to take the storm. Now, we are, in a very real sense, going through a storm, and, and, and maybe because things aren't as challenging in my life as they are for other people, there are definitely people going through some very challenging times right now. I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, that we need to be uh, flexible in uh, in God's plans and God's purposes. If we get rigid and say, God, this is the way it's going to be, and that, and that you, it shouldn't happen this way, many times that can break us, the storms of life. But God is saying to us in a very real way, is let me alter your plans. I, I know you thought things sh should go this way, but I I'm going to make them go this way the New Testament church, they, they were thinking things should go this way. But then they started doing something else. They were scattered when they didn't want to be. They were sharing with the people. Then, and then that changed. And all these changes, all, of this, all this flexibility ended up being used for the glory of God. I encourage you to become flexible and open to God's changing plan. It's not always easy. It can be really hard sometimes. It's frustrating to go through that process. But let God control. Let God alter what we did not necessarily look to be altered. Maybe you're a person that you're listening on this video today and, and, and you uh, church and, 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 and listening about Christ and God, these are all new concepts to you. Maybe God is altering your plans so that you can learn about Him, so He can draw you to His heart. Maybe that's what God is, is using this situation in your life. We see in, in point number two that the church was steered. They weren't stifled. This persecution could have easily stifled them and stopped them, but instead, they allow themselves to be steered and used by God. The last point I want to look at this morning, point number three, we see the church is steadfast and spirit-filled. The church steadfast and spirit-filled. We see this in verses 22 through 24. So please read along with me. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord church steadfast and spirit filled so we're introduced to this person named Barnabas Barnabas was was sent to these new believers uh, to this foreign countries to to help the early church and we have to understand that Barnabas that was not his real name this was a nickname the, the name Barnabas means son of encouragement that this man that was such an uplifting edifying, encouraging force that, that people just call him Barnabas. Man, so you're the son of encouragement. And that is a great person to have in your life if you don't have those people. It's a great person to emulate and strive to be 
in your own life. And it was a great person to send um, to this early church. For starters, he was, a, he was a native. He wasn't originally from Jerusalem. He was from some of these distant lands. And so he was an insider himself. Uh, our text here today said that he was full of the Holy Spirit and he was full of faith. He was full of God's power. He was full of God's presence. Uh, he was full of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means. And, and he was full of faith. He was, he's willing to trust God. He's willing to do what God says he should do. He's willing to go where God says that he should go. He was, uh, he was flexible and available and ready to be used by God. Barnabas is a great guy in the New Testament. And so Barnabas encouraged the church when he got there to remain steadfast in their purpose. They were isolated in a very real sense. These people were isolated from uh, where the New Testament church began and where most believers were at at that time. It was, they were isolated from that. And, uh, this was going to be a hard time for them. This was going to be a challenging time for them. So he said, you need to have some grit. Uh, you guys need to, to stick with it. You guys need to be steadfast in these very difficult times. Well, we can relate to that. Isolation has a, a new uh, meaning for us now, and we can at least to some extent relate to the early church. Romans 15.13 says this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. You have to understand that when the Bible talks about hope, it's not talking about wishful thinking. It's talking about absolute certainty. And it's a certainty based on God and His character who does not lie, who is completely trustworthy and good. When it says, may the God of hope, may the God of certainty fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. You may abound in certainty of what God's doing and His plans and His purposes. See, the church needs a grit that's empowered by grace. See, the church, our church, needs a grit that's empowered by grace. I want you to listen to some of these scriptures that I'll read or, or write them down if you'd like. Proverbs 24, 16 says, For the righteous fall seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in times of calamity. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 say, says, Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing the consistent testimony is scripture as the righteous uh, empowered by God that we can stand we can have grit because we are empowered by God that although we may fall that we can rise and we can rise again because of the power in us. That James says, count it all joys when you face these trials, because these trials will help lead us to steadfastness. And steadfastness by itself leads us to spiritual maturity. A spiritual maturity isn't simply intellectually knowing more about the Bible or about God, but a spiritual maturity is knowing and experiencing and becoming more and more like Christ every day. In the 1700s and 1800s, and, and a little bit before and a little bit after, a line infantry was a, a common uh, a, a battle tactic. And, and we've seen the movies where the, where the, the troops, whether it be in the Revolutionary War or, or the Napoleonic Wars, where, where you'd have soldiers lined up side by side, and they'd have you know, a row of men bes beside them, and they'd be marching towards an enemy that was doing the exact same thing. And, and uh, there was a lot of reasons why they did this. Many of the, um, the, the guns and the, the weapons that they had at that time were, were, were not very good. They were hard to load. 
Um, they weren't very good at aiming uh, with these particular weaponry, and so you really wanted a lot of people being able to put a lot of metal towards some of those targets close by. But the, the, the scary part about you shooting is you had to stand firm. You had to hold the line because uh, the other army was doing the same thing. And if you, and if you broke off, if, if, if you ran away, then you put other people in danger. And so when you were afraid, you had to hold the line. When the enemy was getting closer, you had to hold the line. When people were shooting at you, you had to hold the line. And when your uh, fellow soldiers were beside you and, and dying and being hit, that you had to hold the line. And I encourage you, brothers and sisters, in this time of difficulty, in this time of challenge, this time of tribulation, to hold the line. That we remain steadfast. We remain steadfast in our love. That we remain steadfast in our compassion. We stay, remain steadfast in our trust. We remain steadfast in our giving and our generosity. And we remain steadfast in our witness. So we hold steady because Christ is our rock. He is our refuge. He is our strong tower. He's our fortress. He is our defense. We hold steady because Christ is immovable. And when difficult times will, will push on us, that we have to remain steadfast in our faith, in our love, in our generosity. We have to stay steadfast in those things. But you don't have to do it by yourself. You don't have to do that in your own power. We remain steadfast because Christ is steadfast and he is holding the line. And so all you have to do is hold on to Christ. You may grow weary. You may grow discouraged. You may even grow fearful. I encourage you in those times that will inevitably come to lean into Christ. Don't lean into your own self and your own abilities and your own strength or your own insecurities. Don't, don't lean into that. Lean into Christ the anchor of our souls, our rock, our refuge. We can lean into Him and we will not be moved. We will not be shaken. Imagine with me, church, for just a moment when all of this virus stuff is over with and we get to return uh, with one another, which will be an exciting time. Imagine not just this church, but the Christian church at, at large is strengthened in this time of separation and isolation that we are refocused on our mission and our kingdom purposes. It's easy to get distracted by the things of this world, but where we're refocused, we're strengthened, we're spirit-filled like Barnabas was. Because of all this avert, ad, adversity that, that our church, that the church becomes stronger than it was before. That's what my prayer is. That's what my hope is. Is that God is and continues to use this adversity, these challenging times. Strengthen His church for our good and for His glory. See, the bowstring must be pulled backwards for the arrow to fly. In the church, our country, the world has been pushed backwards, has been pushed against, and we can break or we can bend and then we can fly. Fly to the glory of God. Fly in His strength and His power. Trust God when He disrupts your plan. As we move into an invitation time, an invitation time is simply a way to respond to this message. We don't want to just think about it and, and move on. That We want to reflect on, on God's Word and, and, and realize how we are supposed to respond to that. 
maybe you're wrestling with fear and worry and anxiety right now, and, and you're just concerned about circumstances, you're concerned about the future, you're concerned about a great deal of things. I certainly can relate to that. I can certainly understand people's concern. But we don't want to live in fear and worry. We want to give those to our Savior. So Lord, I, I, I know that you that, that the things are, are, are changed and, and you have us scattered, but I'm going to trust you. Maybe you're dealing with anger and uncertainty, saying, God, I, I didn't want it to go this way. I had plans of my own, how, how things were supposed to be. And you're struggling with anger and uncertainty, and you just need to give that to God this morning. And say, Lord, I, I'm going to trust you when you alter my plan. I, I want to trust you. Please remove anger. Please remove the uncertainty out of my heart. Maybe you're struggling with being steadfast. Uh, you were doing good at first, but it's hard to stay steadfast. It's hard to, to stay the course. And so you're getting tired. You're getting weary. Maybe you're becoming and, and starting to deal with some of these other uh, emotions and feelings that we were just talking about that you hadn't been dealing with before. You want to be a, a godly example to your neighbors and to your family, but you're having trouble holding steady. I encourage you to take that weakness, take those uh, worries, take them to the Lord. Recognize that you don't have to stand in your own strength. We stand in Christ. Christ in us, working through us, empowering us. We don't have to stand alone. We stand in Christ. Uh, in this detour time, could I encourage you to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? Maybe that's something that you've never done before. You don't really know what it means to be a Christian. Uh, then let me explain that briefly, my friend. The Bible says that every one of us have sinned, that every one of us have done wrong. And because of that, we stand guilty before a holy God. You don't have to go through many of the Ten Commandments to realize that I, I, I'm guilty of those. And if God was going to judge us on his standards, not on our changing standards, that we stand guilty before a holy God. The Bible says through the wages of sin is death. Not necessarily immediately physical death, but death of the soul and ultimately separation from God in hell. That's some bad news. It's some very scary stuff. The Bible says there is good news, and that's what we've talked about in this passage today. The good news, the gospel literally means good news, that Jesus Christ came to this earth, that we didn't have to work ourselves up to God, that God came down to us in the form of Jesus Christ. He came and he lived a life that we could not live. He died a death that we could not die. He died in our place. He took all the wrath of God, all the punishment of God that, that I deserved for my sin, and he placed it on Jesus. But just because he did that doesn't mean that the whole world is saved. So we have to place our faith and trust in Jesus. The Bible says that we repent, simply means to turn from our sin, and that we trust in Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he rose three days later from the dead, showing that he has power over sin and death because he is God. We place our faith and trust in him, turn from ourselves being our own God and trust him, and you can become a Christian. You can do that right now in your in your home, on your couch. You don't have to be in a church building to do that. And friend, if, if, you, if, if you're not sure where you'll spend eternity, if you're not sure if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I pray that you would do that today. And if you're not sure about that or if you have any questions, I'd encourage you to please contact uh, me at this church or one of our staff members. You can get on our website and, 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 and call us or contact us through that or, or contact us through our social media or Facebook. If you ha have any questions, um, I, I don't want anybody not knowing where they will spend eternity. So whoever you are, I want to encourage you, friends, to please contact us if you want to follow Christ you have prayer requests that you would like us to, to pray over, uh, please send them to the church. Uh, if you have any questions and we can be helpful, uh, then please just let us know. 
I'm going to pray, and then we'll be done. Father, thank you for this time. I thank you for your word. I thank you for Jesus Christ, who is our rock, our refuge, our hiding place in the storms of life. We love you. Please be with those who are hurting and worried and afraid, those who are harmed by this virus. Lord, I pray that you bring healing to them. Love you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.